Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, which is the changing face of children's literature, circa 1820 to 1920, which is sponsored by Adam Matthew Digital. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a couple of features of the webinar software. Um, first off, all of you out there attending today's webinar, we have turned off your cameras and your mics are muted. So don't worry about generating any feedback or noise or anything like that. We've got that taken care of for you. Um, and also in the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with uh, the presentation materials. We are using the Q&A feature today. So if you have a question throughout the presentation, please go ahead and type it right in that box. Um, we'll take a bit of time at the end to uh, ask as many questions as we have time for of our speakers. Um, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to get to all of the questions that come in, um, but we will you know, do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so as I said, please do drop your questions into that Q&A module throughout the presentation. Um, and please note that we are recording today's program and that everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version of today's presentation. All right, our speakers today are Rachel, Rachel Gardner-Stevens, who is Senior Development Editor at Adam Matthew Digital. Um, we have also with us Natalie Dale, who is the Assistant Editor at Adam Matthew Digital, and Laura Wasowitz, and I apologize if I mispronounced that, Laura, um, Curator of Children's Literature at the American Antiquarian Society. So with that, um, we are ready to get started and I will turn things over to today's first presenter, Rachel. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. And um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, as Mark said, I'm uh, Rachel and I work in the editorial team at Adam Matthew um, and have the absolute pleasure of working on the Children's Literature and Culture Resource. Um, we've got some, some really lively slides for you today, so I'm going to just turn my camera off momentarily and let you enjoy some of the gorgeous visuals that we've got um, coming from the resource. Um, so for anyone who hasn't come across Adam Matthew Digital before, um, we are a global uh, publisher of digital primary sources. Um, we work with archives and libraries all over the globe to digitise content, create collections and make them available for students and researchers. We really pride ourselves on the level of detail that goes into each one of our collections. We work with world leading libraries, archives and research institutions to make their materials available online. And it's important for us to get a consistent level of care and attention to detail all the way through the company. We physically review every item and take a really hands on approach with our partner archives. Our in house editorial team personally image checks and prepares the metadata for all of our collections, sometimes personally indexing work. And today I'd really like to introduce you to one of our most recent publications, Children's Literature and Culture. Children's Literature and Culture is a resource of richly illustrated primary source content um, written specifically for children spanning the 19th and 20th century. Virtually nothing of cultural significance escapes being touched upon in some way within children's print culture. So examining the literature produced for its young people as a way of probing the evolving nature of a society. Across time and place, text and image alike convey the expectations that societies have of their children and present in simply worded and visually compelling ways the aspects and challenges of everyday life faced by young people and their families. This period represents a key time for understanding the place of the child within society as a whole, there was a gradual shift in the early 19th century in the perception of children from little adults to precious beings. Children's literature and culture is a unique and visually stunning primary source collection that documents this history, the literature and print culture, bridging the didactic chapbook era of the long 18th century with the plot and image driven books of the early 20th century and covering many other document types in between. The material in this resource will be essential to students and researchers interested in a broad spread of topics. 
The resource will contain over 8,000 individual documents sourced from two archives, the American Antiquarian Society and the Winterthur Library and Museum. Within those documents will be a broad spread of formats, everything from books and pamphlets to sheet music, toys and games, stereo photographs and original watercolour artworks. The resource will feature a range of genres of literature for children from early forms of instructional and devotional primers through to illustrated rhymes, tales, stories, chapbooks, novels and picture books and case studies of classic children's tales. Materials cover themes such as gender roles and family, perceptions of race, illness and death, morality and behaviour, education and religion. The backbone of the materials curated from the American Antiquarian Society is the McLaughlin Brothers Collection. McLaughlin Bros were an influential New York publishing firm that pioneered the use of colour print technology in children's books between 1858 and 1920. The company's heyday coincides with what's widely regarded as the first golden age of children's literature. The firm are responsible for popularising renowned illustrators and personalities in children's publishing. Their experimentation with colour illustration drove their success as they progressed from hand stenciling to relief printing to the early development of chromolithography. These advances meant that they were frequently able to publish US editions of popular British and European children's books and vastly undercut the original prices of European publishers. So whilst the focus of the collection is American print culture, Children's literature in this period was often transatlantic in content and themes. Materials from the AAS collection also includes a selection of titles from McLaughlin's competitors, and we've included the McLaughlin Art Archive, which is a unique collection of draft illustrations, original paintings, drawings, and proof books. The development of children's literature and culture was a wonderful opportunity for Adam Matthew to collaborate closely with a partner library to create a digital resource. After working with the American Antiquarian Society on our resources, migration to new worlds and global commodities, the AAS drew our attention to their children's literature collection, which is extensive, uniquely well catalogued and widely regarded as the finest in the US. We were absolutely thrilled to work with them to curate this resource and we couldn't have done so without the support and expertise of, of the curatorial staff. They were instrumental in helping us select and shape the resource. Our relationship with Laura Wazowitz who has been curating this enormous collection for over 30 years was especially collaborative. Laura was able to direct us to key parts of the collection um, and to illuminate key themes and subjects both well represented in the collection and heavily studied by researchers. Laura provided advice on how to find that material using her excellent cataloguing data, um, advice we've been able to translate into the published resource. Laura also assisted in Creating, uh, assisted us in creating our editorial board, ensuring that we could consult board members from a wide range of research disciplines who have used the collection itself. So our collaboration with Laura was utterly crucial and extremely valuable. Similarly, we worked with Lauren Hughes, the curator of the graphic arts collection at the AAS. Lauren helped us navigate the varied graphic arts collection, directing us to valuable children's print culture and material outside of literature, such as games, toys, music, and images. This material combines with the literature to build a picture of what adults thought children's life should be like and what some of the actual experiences of childhood were. One of Lauren's recommendations were rewards of merit, which provide a window into the behavioural expectations on children in institutional spaces like schools and churches. Laura also curated a selection of important pieces of sheet music, highlighting the importance of music to middle class children's experience of childhood. Um, some of the pieces were even written by children. Children's books and children's cultural artefacts are incredibly rich primary sources, and we see this resource of being of use to several humanities departments uh, for teaching and varied range and a varied range of research topics, some of which Laura will elaborate on shortly. Um, these documents are useful for historians and students of childhood specifically, but they'll also appeal to a wide range of cultural topics such as gender studies and social history. This is simply because when an idea is presented within children's literature, it's generally understood to have permeated wider society. As a result, the collection allows us to explore the broader social and cultural backdrop of these books. Some of the key themes um, explored I'll just touch upon. Um, so gender, narratives and illustrations throughout reinforce traditional gender roles for boys and girls, whilst the morality tales explore the dangers of flouting them. Uh, conversely, children's literature is actually a great place to find 
real women um, as it's an accepted space within publishing industry for artists and writers to spin their craft. So there are a lot of um, women writers, poets and illustrators represented in this collection. These books can also be used to study conceptions and representations of race. Many of the books and toys reinforce commonly held racial stereotypes, while some examples challenge the common narrative. Children's literature was also a great space to explore how ideas about nationhood are formed, uh, which is pretty important in this period in the US. Uh, some examples here include on the slides, the disorderly girl who's morally judged for her unmodest ways, though she does look like she's having a lot more fun than the more well-behaved girls here. Uh, the Inky Boys by Heinrich Hoffman, a morality tale which has been subject to multiple scholarly interpretations, and Yankee Doodle, an illustrated interpretation of the patriotic song. Literature and book historians will also find valuable lines of inquiry here. Um, the evolution from chapbook and tract to storybook is not just a reflection of how the perception of children changed during this period, but also of the technological advances in printing and book publishing. Chromolithography allowed publishers to print brightly coloured illustrated volumes in high volumes for low cost. Uh, this is where the McLaughlin collection is important as they built their business around these technologies. You get a glimpse of this process through the McLaughlin Art Archive also, and we've included some chromolithographic progressive books uh, to show how these images were built up using this labour intensive technique. For literature historians, the collection can also boast a lot of rare and important first and early editions of children's books, such as uh, Louisa May Olcott's Little Women, Frances, Frances Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden, and What Katie Did by Susan Coolidge, personal favourite of mine. Um, there are also case studies of enduring stories, famous fairy tales and nursery rhymes with multiple editions and versions of Sleeping Beauty, Robin Hood, Robinson Crusoe, Babes in the Wood, Mother Goose and Punch and Judy. Art historians will also hit upon a rich theme in children's literature and culture. These items um, are richly visual and that doesn't exist within a vacuum. These illustrations and artists were interacting with and responding to art. Kate Greenaway is a great example of this. Uh, she was an English artist and poet whose work was greatly influenced by the pre-Raphaelite movement. And she was a correspondent of John Ruskin who critiqued her work. And in turn, Greenaway's style of illustrating children's clothes inspired clothing lines at Liberty and followers of the arts and craft movement in particular liked to dress children in her style. Finally, it's worth noting the importance of children's literature to animal studies researchers. Animals are illustrated and discussed everywhere in this resource, uh, either in books teaching children about animals and what they're for and how they should be treated, but also repeatedly anthropomorphized and taking active parts in stories, often in weird and wonderful ways. Uh, there's a rich theme of cats in hats and dogs in uniforms uh, for those who are interested in researching that. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Natalie, who will take you through some of the features and functionality of the resource. Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Dale and I'm an assistant editor at Adam Matthew. I've been at Adam Matthew for almost three years now and I've worked on a really diverse range of collections such as Foreign Office Files for Southeast Asia, Shakespeare's Globe and Sex and Sexuality. I'd just like to take you through some of the editorial considerations and features we've put together to really showcase this fantastic material. We were very lucky in having a huge amount of metadata from the AAS catalogue, which from the outset gave us a great stepping stone into the different ways of organising the items in this collection. Our documents list will allow researchers to navigate to areas of interest by theme or by document type, and each item in the collection is tagged with key themes, document type and subject terms to really guide researchers through the key areas of interest within children's literature and culture. These themes have been decided upon in collaboration with our editorial board and they allow the material to be explored in a wider cultural context, looking at themes of Victorian attitudes around morality, celebrations and holidays, women in publishing, representation of disability and changes in educational techniques. Further search functionality is available with our search directories, which allow researchers to find documents through genre, Library of Congress subject headings, people or publishers. If researchers are interested in a particular author or illustrator, for example, this would be a good way of narrowing down the search to those relevant documents very quickly. And this would include any documents tagged with that name in your search results. The publisher list here can be useful in tracking how a business may have changed over time. 
So for example, there are slight name changes or inclusion of partner names, which offer some insight into how publishers have changed or expanded over this period. And for anyone who might like some more guidance on how best to use this resource to find the key material for their research interest, we've also included a search tools page in the site. And this offers further information on search functionality, including OCR, thematic categorization, basic and advanced searches, and information on particular highlights and features. That's a great starting point for anyone who would like an overview on how to really utilize the features and functionality that we've built into the resource to really showcase this collection. We've also compiled a collection of over 70 biographies of key authors and illustrators of the 19th century. Clicking on these names will take a researcher to a list of their works, which we have included in the resource. And these include some very well-known names such as Kate Greenaway, Lewis Carroll, Walter Crane and Louisa May Alcott alongside some lesser known names such as Anna, Anna Barbold, who was an innovator of didactic methods in children's literature and insisted on large print texts and using the narrative style of a conversation between parent and child. We also have some essays by leading academics in children's literature, which cover areas such as representation of race, animals and nature and patriotism, placing these documents in a wider historical and cultural context. Our fantastic video with Laura explores the growth in the production of children's books, the book Beautiful, the scope of the collection and the expectations and challenges on the 19th century child, including illness, disability and death in the family. In addition, we have some exhibitions which follow some examples of the artwork in children's literature from draft to publication, including the very important advent of colour printing of which the McLaughlin brothers were the American pioneers. The collection also includes three case studies tracking the evolution of some classic children's literature texts, including Robinson Crusoe, which underwent significant revisions from its publication in 1719 in order to make it more appropriate for the juvenile reader. Originally printed for children in a summarised chapbook format, it was also developed as a single syllable text in a primer style story for early readers, like many well-known texts of the time, and as a toy book filled with colourful illustrations. It can't be stressed enough how stunningly visual this collection is, which makes for some incredibly rich galleries. And in these galleries, you can explore beautiful illustrations, you can see changes in printing techniques, or take a closer look at toys and games from this period, and stereo photographs, all images which really bring to life the leisure and culture of the 19th century alongside advancements in printing and illustration in this period. It's been a real joy to work on this collection for so many reasons, but in particular that the material is really visually stunning and it's really fun. We have the toys and games that I've mentioned and this shift from the more didactic text to creative, imaginative and playful text alongside toys and games. And that movement really shines through in this resource. You can also see glimpses in this material which highlight their role in school and in the family home, which offers a fascinating insight into how these books were used as an educational tool. Primers play a significant role in the early stages of teaching children to read, and there are over 200 examples to be found in the documents of children's literature and culture. One primer which really caught my attention had an inscription on the inside which read, presented to G.W. Jackson on December the 25th, 1850 by his grandfather Jackson. And this is followed by, presented to Elma Jackson, December the 25th, 1877 by her pa. This 27 year gap between inscriptions and the inclusion of the family name show that this is a treasured item, something which has been kept and passed down from father to daughter. This could perhaps have ignited a love of literature or brought a nostalgia for this time spent together as a family at Christmas. There are also instances of names written into the inside cover over several years, which show the progression in a child's handwriting or attempts at writing passages for the first time or drawing. These documents, which have sketches, notes and inscriptions, are often tagged with the LOC term annotations, which allows a really fascinating insight into the way these texts were used before they made their way into the archives. I will now hand you over to Laura. All right, thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Rachel. And uh, here I go from the curatorial viewpoint. Um, as as uh, my two 
um, colleagues have des already described, children's literature and culture contains upwards of 8,600 digitized items that give vivid testimony to the social and economic upheavals, reform movements, industrial innovations, and changing cultural norms as they were presented to the young of an America that was in itself in transition from a fledgling republic to an imperialistic power. Children's literature and culture allows researchers, particularly those new to the study of children's print culture, unparalleled access to a resource visually and textually rich in culturally prevailing as well as countercultural attitudes towards key concepts, including gender roles, race relations, work ethic, financial awareness, slavery, temperance, illness, and religion. This resource contains superb metadata, providing for a wide variety of access points along with keyword searching capability, allowing researchers, regardless of experience, to take a deep dive into the material that bridges the long 18th century chapbook and the turn into the 20th century book, Beautiful. Okay, and uh, next slide, yes. Um, as seen in this example, access to this material through subjects is crucial and that many 19th century children's book titles can be described as euphemistic at best. Take, for example, this didactic novel, Little Robert and His Friend. Published in 1860, it is about Robert Wilson, a boy of African Caucasian ancestry who considers committing suicide by jumping off a cliff after being taunted by his peers because of his mixed race. He is stopped from doing so by Frederick Alton, a white boy who has just started attending Robert's school. And you see that um, Frederick is running up behind Robert to keep him from killing himself. Obviously, the title tells one very little about the book's plot. So subject access points like racially mixed children, suicide, interracial adoption are critically, absolutely critical in giving this understudied text the attention it deserves. Similarly, the genre asks this point for fantasy literature puts well-known texts like Alice in Wonderland in conversation with lesser known titles such as Jane Goodwin Austen's juvenile novel, Moonfolk from 1874. And physical attributes like drawings provide consistent access to items bearing impromptu drawings made by young readers, as in this example found on the blank verso pages of Greenaway Pictures to Paint number two. This unprecedented level of search access opens a new avenue of primary source material to a wide variety of researchers. The bulk of this material, uh, digitized by Adam Matthew for children's literature and culture, comes from the collections held at the American Antiquarian Society, an independent research library located in Worcester, Massachusetts. The AAS was founded in 1812 under the leadership of American printer Isaiah Thomas, who astutely recognized children's books as a profitable product line and reissued many of John Newberry's chapbooks after the American Revolution. For reasons that we are now trying to uncover, Thomas's children's book publications slipped through the cracks and were not accessioned at AAS, along with copies representing the rest of Thomas's publishing output, output upon his death in 1831. So it was nearly a century later in the 19 teens that the society became one of the earliest research libraries to assemble a comprehensive collection of historical children's literature under the visionary leadership of AAS director Clarence Brigham, who was quick to recognize that children's literature reflects not only significant religious and cultural ideas, but also embodies artifactual evidence of early American print culture. Children's literature as a field of study is rooted in a variety of disciplines, including education, the history of the book, literature, folklore, library science, American studies, women's history, and gender studies. Being a recognized academic discipline in its own right, children's literature is a valuable resource that enriches the historical study of just about any subject from food to medicine to natural history, enriching contextual understanding of the society which created it. The more than 8,000 pieces digitized for children's literature and culture document the changes sweeping transatlantic culture in a century.
What follows is a thumbnail description of several key contextual strands that are reflected in the digitized pieces comprising this resource. The first strand, the printed dissemination of religious beliefs, particularly Protestant Christianity. Anglo-American colonies were settled in the 17th and early 18th centuries, largely by Protestants, many of whom were convinced of the importance of each person being able to read the Bible, regardless of age or gender. As a result, there was a great deal of emphasis placed on early childhood literacy in colonial America. As a result, there was um, a great, for this reason, the New England Primer served as a key initial text placed in an American child's hands in the 18th through early 19th centuries. It was actually a collection of various texts, including a pictorial alphabet in verse featuring biblical figures and a Protestant catechism. One of the earliest titles included in children's literature and culture is Beauties of the New England Primer seen here, a selection of highlights from this time-honored text. Just as Beauties was published in 1820, there was a wave of Christian publishing aimed squarely at children and youth through newly founded regional and national tract societies. Oh, oh boy, go back. Oh, let's see. There we are. This was an international movement led by writers like the British reformer, Hannah Moore, who sought to use cheaply printed pamphlets called tracts, promoting evangelical Christianity through didactic fiction that could be distributed to the poor of all ages as an alternative to novels containing sensational accounts of seduction or violent adventure. Initially established in American cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia to teach poor people, regardless of age, gender, or race, to read scripture on Sundays, which was the one day off for most working class adults and children at the time, regional societies like the New England Tract Society and the Philadelphia Adult and Sunday School Union Union eventually became respectively the American Tract Society and the American Sunday School Union. The ATS and ASSU dominated publishing for children and youth in the United States before the Civil War, and both had extensive networks of book depositories that literally covered the United States. And with this nationwide distribution, Sunday schools soon became an institution used by children and youth across social classes, and the tract societies met this ongoing need for suitable reading material by publishing cabinet libraries containing samplings of the thousands of titles produced by these tract societies, giving young people regular access to books decades before the establishment of the modern public libraries beginning in the 1870s. Children's literature and culture includes over 500 examples of Sunday school literature and is a critical source for researchers seeking to construct a popular canon of literature written for children and youth that would have been read and recognized across class lines. This religious literature encouraged self-agency in actively learning scripture, reading the Bible and other religious texts, embracing the Christian life through self-sacrifice and the recognition of Jesus as savior and guide. Which brings me to the second strand, the pervasive emphasis upon the importance of early literacy and the belief in the printed word and images ability to convey moral responsibility and a solid work ethic. Unlike Great Britain and Europe, the fledgling Republic of the United States was not built upon an inherited monarchy that ruled over generations. As a result, much of the literature for children and youth published in the New Republic has an emphatically didactic tone in which a story and its accompanying illustration were created to convey the educational lesson. Take, for example, this picture book, The Little Sketchbook, number two, the Young Farmer. Published in 1830, it has this small but compelling frontispiece by Massachusetts engraver Albert, Albert Alden. This wonderfully detailed image shows a boy of about 10 heading off to work in the field with a pitchfork in one hand. And as the text 
describes a small keg of beer in the other. He wears trousers, sturdy shoes, a cap, and a protective smock. He is walking alone to his work. His face has a serious, determined look. The text explains, quote, this little boy is happy because he is industrious. An idle boy cannot be happy. Unquote. Although the illustration shows him going to work, according to the text, he attends school, quote, to learn those lessons which will fit him to be a useful member of the community, unquote. So these values of self-reliance, practicality, discipline, and work ethic are ingrained both in the printed image and word. Courtney Weichel Mills has contributed an essay to the Children's Literature and Culture Resource on the concept of child citizenship. Which brings me to the third strand, reform as a means of moral and religious perfectibility. Hand in hand with the prevailing belief in the role of human agency by people, regardless of gender, race, or age, to embrace the Protestant Christianity promoted by many antebellum American writers and the powerfully influential tract publishers, also came the promotion of perfecting the person and the larger society through various reforms, including temperance, abolition, racial equity, and animal welfare. One of the results was the establishment of several free schools in New York for African American children and youth set up by prominent New York businessmen, including Samuel Wood, a Quaker who was among the first American publishers to focus on children's books. These free schools are documented in Charles C. Andrews' History of the New York African Free Schools from 1830. This history not only provides insight into the education of free African Americans in New York before the Civil War, it includes examples of the artistic and literary work created by young African Americans, like this image of the school drawn by New York African Free School student, Patrick Henry Reason, and written pieces by fellow students, Adeline Groves and Jane James McCune Smith, the first professionally trained African American physician. The metadata reflects the richness of this text with, index, uh, with access points for juvenilia, African American children, monitorial system of education, charity schools, and school children. To learn more about race in early American children's literature, read Nazira Wright's essay in Children's Literature and Culture. The fourth strand, the profound changes in family and gender relations brought about by the physical and social separation of the workplace from the home and the concurrent move toward a cash-based economy. Perhaps the greatest societal change reflected in American children's print culture between 1820 and 1920 was the socioeconomic removal of the workplace from the home in growing American cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, and the simultaneous movement away from barter toward cash for consumer react, uh, transactions. It served to construct more highly gendered space in American life around the role of men as breadwomen winners and women as homemakers presiding over home-centered functions occurring there, especially the moral, religious, and academic education of young children. So it is not surprising that mothers are referenced in over 200 items in children's literature and culture, including Sir Richard Phillips' first or mother's catechism containing common things necessary to be known by children at an early age. As a text, it straddles references to both a home and an institutional school as a locus of early learning, proclaiming it as the first book for primary schools in the United States. Originally written for English children, it was quickly adapted for America, and the title with its mother branding speaks to the fluidity of place in early education. Educational reformers like Horace Mann successfully pushed for legislation to establish common schools across the state of Massachusetts, which was a national leader in free education. This legislation provided for publicly funded education in accordance with the statewide standard and the institutional of, institution of normal schools to educate professional teachers, with women being increasingly considered the initial primary guardians of juvenile education. This educational role expanded job opportunities for women outside of the home as school teachers and writers for children. Over 800 pieces by women authors are accessible in children's literature and culture through the access point, Women as Authors. 
With these socioeconomic changes, many, but by no means all, 19th century American children operated more as consumers than producers of economic goods, including print culture, and had the relative leisure to consider various professions and play at performing economic activities. The increasing number of occupations and professions available to boys as they grew up can be examined in the pages of books of occupations, like the books of trades and professions from 1849. Besides the printer, tailor, and carpenter also included are occupations catering to the expanding middle class like the piano forte manufacturer, bookseller, and print seller. Books and paper games pertaining to money and its use gained popularity as seen in late 19th century artist William Momberger's set of Toy Money issued by Richard Shug, who was also a picture book publisher. Besides reading about and imitating the world of grown-ups, children who grew up in middle-class or wealthy households had at least some leisure to read and enjoy picture books and juvenile novels. Both genres came into their own during the 19th century with the development of industrial scale printing technologies pioneered by successful publishers like McLaughlin Brothers. And with the development of the tabletop press in the 1860s came a new form of juvenilia, the amateur press. Children's literature and culture has several examples of amateur books written and printed by young people, including this adventure story, The Boy Smuggler, penned by 16 year old Edward C. Gay. Traditional fairy tales read for amusement like Tom Thumb, Sinbad the Sailor, and Cinderella are well represented over time in children's literature and culture, from the chapbooks of the 1820s through the early 20th century. The number of picture book fairy tales published in the United States really exploded from the 1840s onward, due at least in part to the influx of German immigrants to the United States. Also, mid-19th century firms like McLaughlin Brothers that specialized in picture book publishing were eager to capitalize on printing their own versions of time-honored tales that had mass appeal. <laughs> However, not all young people were able to enjoy a youth dominated by school and leisure. <laughs> And 19th century children's print culture reflects that fact and the numerous stories about poor children who had to work to support themselves. Subjects including child labor, orphans, and paper boys provide access to hundreds of relevant items, including Frances Hudson Burnett's juvenile novel, A Little Princess. <clears throat> Which brings me to the fifth contextual strand, Technological innovation reflected in the quantity and aesthetic quality of children's print culture. Children's literature and culture documents a critical period in the history of the children's book. Its coverage begins in the 1820s when illustrations were few and were generally printed on wood blocks, a relatively inexpensive process in which the lines of the image are raised like the typeset of the text. Both the block and the set type were locked into the bed of a hand press for printing. This image taken from an 1858 edition of Cinderella is an example of wood engravings hand colored with stencils. <clears throat> One young apprentice who trained as a printer and wood engraver was John McLaughlin Jr., who eventually co-founded McLaughlin Brothers in 1858, a company that would come to dominate the production of children's picture books, puzzles, games, and paper toys in the United States. A tireless innovator, John, along with his brother Edmund, perfected and patented a process whereby drawn images could be photographed onto sturdy zinc plates that were chemically treated to hold a relief image that has raised lines and printed text. This method, this method essentially mechanized color printing on an industrial scale. It also allowed for the easy transfer of an artist's drawing directly onto the image plate. Here's an example of a McLaughlin edition of Aladdin from the 1870s, color printed using this method. It has a smeary look to it. Also in the second half of the 19th century, the process of mechanized chromolithography was perfected by which images are drawn or photographically transferred onto stones that were chemically treated to absorb applied colors. 
This image was run through the press multiple times with stones inked with a specific color, multiplying the possible number of color shades, a process used by McLaughlin on a large scale beginning in the 1890s. Chromolithography produces a multi-shaded image with a dotted texture, as seen in this cover for Little Housekeeper, published in 1904. So altogether, these three examples serve as a visual primer to the profound changes to the look of children's books occurring in the second half of the 19th century. Children's literature and culture also includes digital copies of selected games and paper dolls, as well as drawing pr and proofs for illustrations from the McLaughlin Business Archives, allowing the user to literally follow an image from a drawing to the published product. As a quick example, here is a full color drawing of Native Americans on the move. This same image was published in the picture book, A Peep at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. You see it on the left, printed in muted shades of gray and red as a contrast to the, to the newly arrived white settlers here portrayed in full color, which well, reserves, which well deserves a separate discussion all its own. Improvements in color print technology served to usher in the era that we now call the book beautiful, in which the artist's design could be printed relatively expen inexpensively in full color in print runs of between 10 to hundreds of thousands of copies. Artists who immediately benefited from this development include Thomas Nast and Ida Waugh. Nast was commissioned by McLaughlin Brothers in the 1860s to illustrate several picture books, the most famous of which is The Night Before Christmas. Nast was already well known for his political cartoons, so picture book illustration, particularly of larger than life American legends like Yankee Doodle, was an easy leap. Born into an artistic family, Ida Waugh studied in Paris and at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, just as it was opening life drawing classes to women students. Today, Ida Waugh might be best known for her two-dimensional illustrations of children in fancifully historical costume, much like her English counterpart, Kate Greenaway. But Waugh deserves study in her own right as a professional artist who incorporated popular aesthetic trends to gain commissions and a living. Children's literature and culture contains nearly 400 examples of books and drawings designed by women illustrators and engravers. They can be retrieved through the access point women as illustrators. The digital resource is particularly rich in examples of work by late 19th, early 20th century women artists, including Georgina Davis, whose career is explored by art historian Francesca Tancini in her piece From Rough Sketch to Final Illustration for Children's Literature and Culture. Another woman artist well represented in this resource is Sarah Noble Ives, who skillfully created this Art Nouveau drawing of Cinderella for McLaughlin Brothers, seen here. These women created fine art that was displayed at public exhibitions in addition to their paid illustration work for the book trade. Their extant body of work, though, largely survives only in the pages of children's books, and they are awaiting large-scale rediscovery in children's literature and culture. So taken as a whole, children's literature and culture is a digital resource that provides unprecedented visual and intellectual access to the corpus of children's print culture published in the United States within a seminal period of socioeconomic change from which sprung forth a defined print market for children and youth, which flourishes to this day. The text and images of children's literature and culture represent a seminal um, it represent both the light and darkness of these times, the humor, the sorrow, the sexism, the racism, the uncertainty and the joy. And in some cases, we can see the evidence of young readers in their coloring, scribbles, owner's verses and marginalia, providing new insights into how these pieces were actually used. From these literal survivors of hard use and obscurity, we get a clearer sense of the everyday life and aspirations for and by young people who had muted agency and attention in the larger historical record dominated by the activities of white male adults. So in no small way, children's literature and culture opens new aspects of 19th and early 20th century history, largely invisible elsewhere. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, Laura. And looking at the time, we have plenty of time for questions. If folks out there in the audience have questions for any of our speakers today. Um, looking at the Q&A box, um, we've got a couple of questions in there. Um, and the first one I think that we have from Susie is um, sort of a long one, but I, I wonder if uh, I could put this to you perhaps, Laura. And Susie says, it has been my contention that children's literature reflect what a society believes are its values and perceptions of itself, though not as it really is. That what it wants to imprint on children, uh, though that is what it wants to imprint on children, excuse me, though not always a true picture. And is that a fair assumption, do you think, Laura? Or how, how would you? Uh, oh, oh, yes, it is. Yeah, I would say that's a, a fair assumption. Um, and so it's important not to take the literature and the image at face value, I would say. And that's what that's where um, the challenge to the researcher comes in. First of all, it's important to use um, uh, to really, if you can search across media to look at the printed children's literature, which is, yeah, by its nature didactic. Um, if you can also uh, look at um, the picture, like I said, the pictures, which are um, Anna, um, indexed in dr um, the term drawings, also in uh, annotations, which will show um, the, the child's reading um, and the check marks or the X's that are drawn through text or the um, illustrations and the additions of, of, of own text um, put in by the reader. So, and these are fleeting, they are ephemeral, but they're very, it's very important. And that's why this sort of metadata, which indexes annotations or drawings, are so incredibly important. Also, it's important to um, do your homework on who created the text. And that's why um, the Adam Matthew putting in the biographies of prominent people associated with these texts is so important because that will help you fill in the blanks as to the agenda with which the text is being written. Like who is Louisa May Alcott? Who is Kate Greenaway? Did they have to write for a living? Were they ladies of leisure? Well, I can say in both cases, no. <laughs> but you, but so, and, and also take into account who's publishing and their agenda. Now, yeah, certainly American Track Society, the American Sunday School Union, especially the American Sunday School Union, um, in the American Track Society, yeah, it's the American Track Society that split over the, um, split over the issue of, um, slavery. So somewhere in the 1860s, 70s, you have the split between the Boston branch, which was more abolitionist, anti-slavery in tone, and the New York Tract Society that tended to be rather quiet because they, they, they were drawing um, from benefactors in the South. So that's another thing. Also, there is the American Reform Tract and Book Society that put forth the um, uh, abolition as one of its key goals. So they are ardently abolition, uh, abolitionists as opposed to the, track society, the other track societies. So you really have to read it through a lens, various lenses that involve interaction with the reader where possible, the publisher, which I cannot, you know, people often don't look at the publisher. And I think the publisher, at least in this historical, I'd say in any historical context has an agenda. So you wanna dig into that too, um, and the writer. Um, also looking at what is not said as well as what is said in the text. What is, and, and does that mesh with the illustration or not? So this, this really puts a lot of heavy lifting on the researcher to do her homework and looking, uh, really digging into the context within which the, the work was created and also annotated and used. So yeah, it's a long roundabout question, but off, in often cases, this is, this is a starting point. This is something that we have to begin with. And if you start doing research on African-American literature, like my friend Nazira Wright has done within the last five, 10 years, she discovers that, that um, didactic fiction written for white publications was appropriated 
for black pu publications by, by black editors um, for say the Colored American, which was a periodical that had a, um, a children's section. So that's why you cannot just brush off this literature because it's going to have an impact across race and class and gender lines. So it's, I think the answer is yes, but it's, but in practice, um, to, to really see the, the historical reality as much as we can, the, answer, the, the way that you're getting um, the answer is going to be a bit more complicated and messy. Excellent. That's fascinating and, and so interesting to see all of the various intersections and the avenues for investigation that these documents open up. Um, looking through our questions, we have one here. Um, that came in recently, I think, from uh, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline says, could you please elaborate on the paper doll collection? And do you have any movable books? <laughs> um, yes, we do. Uh, we have, um, oh my, that's a quick, we have, um, we do not have a, um, we don't have a comprehensive collection by any means, but we have a really good representative collection of paper dolls, which are indexed with the term paper dolls. And you mm -hmm. can look in our online catalog and you can also look in um, the Adam Matthew resource for things that were explicitly selected by my friend Rachel and her colleagues for that product. But yes, we do have paper dolls. Um, some handmade, a lot that were printed. Many of the paper dolls came to us through the McLaughlin Brothers Business Archive, which was a section, just a, a maybe about a half of their business archive that came to us as a donation in 1978. There are other com components of that archive that are spread across um, in other repositories, but as far as we know, we got the paper dolls. <laughs> and we do collect paper dolls uh, selectively, um, generally according to um, whether they're affiliated with a book or a game already in our collection. So yes, um, that so we do add to the collection. Um, we also, yes, we do do have movable books. Um, they are accessible through, um, and, and that's going to include um, panoramas um, and also books that are moved through tabs. Um, we the general um, key the general genre of physical format search would be metamorphic pictures. Um, we also have the uh, search term uh, mechanical works. So between those, um, you will find what you're, you're looking for. We are always delighted to get more uh, panoramic picture books that are the pullout type or, um, and also related mechanical paper, do um, paper toys like the uh, Meyer Opticon of, um, of Milton Bradley. So, Yes, we, we do have those. Um, they do tend to be rare, especially in pristine condition. <laughs> so it's a half gla glass, half empty, half full sort of proposition because the ones that are heavily used with half of the pieces gone, at least you have an idea of what the person enjoyed, what the reader enjoyed using, right? <laughs> but the ones that come uh, from the publisher, we also delight in that because we get a sense of how it came out of the box. And there are a lot of pieces that are in between that are lightly used. So yes, we have, um, and, um, and games and our metamorphic picture books have also, uh, many of them pieces have been scanned, um, selected by my Adam Matthew colleagues. Excellent, um, excellent. Yeah, Please go ahead. Add to Laura's amazing description of the, um, <laughs> yeah, the paper dolls. Um, just to, to highlight some of the things that we've included in the collection. So um, we've included a lot of um, paper dolls that are of the format with them, um, a kind of a mannequin style body, and then lots of outfits that you can, um, that children could put onto um, those bodies and change all of their um, outfits. And some of them were um, children, some of them are more adult. Um, we have some some bridal wear ones, for example. Um, we have we also have a kind of a range of a lot of them are um, girls and women, but we have them um, a range of different bits and bobs as well. Some um, uh, musicians playing musical instruments that, that also kind of move as well, um, and some um, some really fun ones with um, a horse and jockey. 
Um, so we've got a real um, good sample of, of materials across um, that paper doll collection. And um, Laura, I was just going to ask as well, would, would pop-up books count as that kind of metamorphic? Uh, meta yes. We've yeah. got a few of those which are really special. Yeah. Great, great. Always interesting. Um, so one of the, and perhaps this is a question um, that should go to you, um, Rachel, or, or perhaps to you, Natalie. Um, if we had a question in here from Elizabeth, um, who is curious about knowing the experience of navigating through the collections. Um, and Elizabeth says, one of the limitations of using my own library catalog with links to digitized materials is that there's an awful lot of clicks to get to different items and things aren't grouped together in necessarily logical ways for teaching. And the result is that it's not really possible to browse effectively when searching for a topic. She says, it seems like this resource allows for students to easily browse one of your curated topics. For instance, um, Elizabeth asks, could I assign a unit on citizenship and easily invite the students to click through and peruse the materials under that category for us to discuss. So could you talk a little bit about navigating the, uh, the archive and uh, getting to specific sorts of material? Yeah, so I think a really great place to start would be our search tools page. And that really gives you a good overview of how we've sort of put that search functionality in. Um, we do definitely encourage um, students to sort of explore the documents at their own pace as well and find out their own key um, research interests. And we do some work with our outreach team on this as well. Um, the search directories is definitely a great place to start for any sort of key terms. And it's really in terms of numbers of clicks through. I mean, you'll add your search terms in and then you'll get a list of anything that is tagged with that term. So I think that's a really great starting point. Um, we also, it depends on what you're interested in really, but um, we've got related documents as well. So any sort of related documents in the uh, resource, for example, different editions um, across different publications, um, those are all linked. So you could literally just click through a list of links and you'd be able to then explore the different changes in those editions over time. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if Rachel's got anything to add on that at all. Yeah, so in terms of browsing, it's, it's quite a pleasant experience. Um, if, you, if you navigate to the documents tab in the resource, um, and then you have, have an option of, of starting to drill down into the documents by theme, um, by clicking on one of the associated thumbnails. And there are, um, there are around, 12 or 15 themes, is that right, Natalie? So sort of anything from kind of animals and nature to um, religion. Um, so if you if you wanted to set a research topic on a particular theme, that's a really good place to start. Um, students and researchers can then start as well, drilling down by document type. Um, so if they're particularly interested in paper dolls, um, they can click on paper dolls and, and start looking into that. Um, and, and also um, we have a, a feature called My Archive where students, when they find things that, that they are um, interested in, they want to return to, they can save um, in that part of the resource. So they, they, don't, they can go back to it and they can start building up their own little curated collection of materials, um, which is really useful if they're, if they're working on a paper um, and referring to lots of different primary sources. Um, so that's, yeah, that's some of the ways that um, students can kind of quite easily navigate this resource. Excellent, excellent. And we have lots of questions coming in. So as I said at the beginning, if we don't get to your question, my apologies. Um, our time today is somewhat limited. Um, so looking through uh, some of the earlier questions that came in. Um, Let's see, all right, we've got, as I said, lots of questions, sorry for that. Um, the, I think one thing um, that came in a little bit earlier um, that's directed toward Laura, I think from Gretchen, is could you speak a bit more about the games that are included in the collection? I know we've talked uh, about the paper dolls and, and the movable books and things like that. Um, 
could you and for the yep. Adam Matthew folks, could you talk about digitizing them um, mm -hmm. and some of the difficulty there? So would you like to start out on that, Laura? Oh, yeah, sure. We have um, hundreds of games um, and it's a growing collection and it's it's uh, more I mean, it's it's becoming an incredibly well used resource. I know at this institution um, it, and it's it really is wonderful because it, it shows the continuity between um, a lot of publishers who publish children's books. Um, sometimes they would branch out and also publish games um, such as um, the Ives who eventually became Parker Brothers and McLaughlin Brothers, the aforementioned Parker Brothers and Milton Bradley for that matter. And so uh, it's, it's, it's just um, wonderful from so many different perspectives because it, it addresses um, issues such as money, how to use it. If you go to like the country storekeeper sh um, um, game, how you have money, how do you use it? You know, or taking trips or seeing the, uh, the, 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 the great um, centennial of 1876. So there, um, there was also um, a book that was uh, written by a woman named Ann Abbott who uh, it was about Do Dr. Busby and it was um, written around a game where you could, um, it, it, the, this, the book tells the story of these um, cards featuring, and it was like a game of lotto. You had to put all members of Dr. Busby's family together and the next door neighbor's family together and whoever did that got to win. <laughs> so it, it's, a um, yeah, there, the, we, um, we put a big emphasis on cataloging, and that's why Adam Matthew was uh, so interested in digitizing um, the, uh, our games, a good number of our games. So um, you, you, you have the subjects, you have the, um, what type of illustration technique was used to produce the game, which was it was it metal engraving? Was it chromolithography? And that answer is going to change, especially as you go through the 19th century. So um, that we we have people who are interested in consumer culture, in illustration history, in literary history, in biography. A lot of games have to do with authors. So it's it's there again. It's a reflection of the culture at large and what what value was placed on what topics and what people at that time. So that's, that gives you an idea. And uh, yes, I'd like to learn from my colleagues. How was it um, scanning that material or getting arranging to have it scanned properly? Um, we were very lucky, really. We didn't uh, have very many issues from our side, but I'm sure there was a lot happening with the scanning <laughs> team that we didn't, that we didn't see. Um, yeah, it was it was really interesting to sort of capture some of those 3D elements. We also, though, have quite a lot of card games and things like that, mm -hmm. things like the Game of the Goose. Um, and yeah, um, all really fascinating stuff, some of which you can see uh, is very relatable in sort of family games um, now, really, sort of the card games and, and mm -hmm. parlor games and like that. It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there were some challenges from the scanning side. <laughs> but, um, beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, we, no, so I was going to say, um, for a lot of those card games and some of those other the toys that we digitised, um, our, our aim was to try and um, kind of digitise as, as much of it as possible. So I think um, the, the main consideration when digitising toys is, is that it, it's slow and a mm -hmm. bit fiddly. So I think, um, yeah, just, just giving yourself kind of enough time to do it and, and expecting it to, um, it's not quite as satisfying as scanning a book, I think. Um, so yeah, that would, that's probably our main takeaway. Yeah, and making sure that it makes sense as well, because um, yeah, it, the, the movement of, of the items needs to make sense as you're going through the images as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And sometimes it's worth scanning something at a slightly higher DPI than you might normally um, because of items that are just very, very wee and small. Um, and you, you get a better quality image if you do that. Excellent, excellent. Very interesting to learn a little bit about the process and 
and how that works. Um, looking at our at the clock here, we have run just a little bit over, for which I, I apologize. <laughs> um, but I would love to take the opportunity to say thank you to each of our speakers today. Um, to you, Laura, and to Natalie, and to Rachel for taking time to walk us through this collection and um, really start to begin to, to put it into a little bit of a larger context for, for the viewers out there. So thank you so much. Um, and I will just say thank you to all of you out there listening in. Um, we appreciate your taking the time to join us today. Um, and if you have a moment um, as you sign out, you should be directed to a brief survey. If you could just give us a, um, a couple of answers to three, four, five questions, we would really appreciate that. That feedback um, is, is very valuable and helps us to improve the program. So uh, once again, thanks to everybody. Um, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another program. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.